this is a continuation of question period after uh, Dr. Moshe Schiff's lecture. Uh, and it is really a response to the great interest that public showed and requested that we complete the list of questions. So Dr. Schiff, I will uh, read the list, uh, read from the list of the questions and uh, ask you to answer them. All right, the first is Rad Jassim, how close your work to Piaget's cognitive development is to, I suppose, to the Piaget's okay. cognitive development. Can you repeat the question? Yes, once again. The Rad Jassim asks, how close is your work to Piaget's cognitive development theories, I believe you should be. And to be honest with you, my work doesn't even touch on these issues. Uh, we are working at a completely different level of the level of the DNA. And the field has an approach yet um, the level that we connect in um, sophisticated psychological processes with uh, or theories with uh, molecular events. Uh, we are at a very crude level uh, of understanding. So I would not um, even try, I've been attempt to say that you know our work supports uh, one one of these theories or the other. Right. Okay, now Claude Lalande has two questions. Uh, first, is there any relevance of classical separated twin studies in understanding epigenetics? Right. And uh, of course, uh, twin studies are very interesting for epigenetics because uh, the main problem with epigenetics is how to differentiate genetic events from epigenetic events. Because changes in the genetic sequence that we inherited can affect the way the epigenetic uh, uh, our, uh, marks are, are laid down. And we know for sure that there are certain genetic differences that can cause epigenetic differences. And actually they are being mapped. So when you have a human being who is, who is not an identical twin of another human being and you want to compare epigenetic profiles in that person versus the other person, what is the role of environment versus the role of genetics? You can't sort it out. So therefore twin studies, identical twin studies are very important for sorting out genetic from epigenetic effects. What's interesting about twins is that even identical twins during their life, they will develop epigenetic differences and they discordance between twins in epigenetic uh, marks can be sometimes associated with discordance in disease. So. Uh, we, we have examples where uh, two twins, two identical twins, one succumbs to Alzheimer and the other not. Uh, one has asthma and the other not. And so these cases of discordance where you have genetic identity, but the difference in phenotype or in disease is a, is a, is a great source for understanding and differentiating epigenetic causes of disease from genetic causes. Right. Okay, so uh, the next question is uh, by still by Claude Lalande. Is there a different strength of epigenetic patterns if, a, if established in early age versus later in life? So it is believed that the epigenetic patterns that are established early in life are important for what we call differentiation. Uh, these have to be stable because they, uh, they define how our tissues work. And, uh, you know, potentially our genetics allows for every cell in our body to do anything. And so um, during embryogenesis, uh, each cell gets a specific task. And we believe that these are etched in stone because a change in these profiles uh, will be horrible to the phenotype. And for example, cancer involves a change in those genes and the methylation of those genes. So genes that are responsible for maintaining what I call cell identity are now altered. The, not the genetics, but the epigenetics is altered. And now rather than getting a breast cell, you get a breast cancer cell. And so it is believed that there are many processes and mechanisms to make sure that the um, basic matrix of epigenetics that controls cell type specificity is very hard to change. The other question you're asking is, 
other changes that happen to epigenetics early in life that are not part of this differentiation uh, process that go, are caused by, let's say, environmental exposures or early environmental exposures versus changes that occur later in life, uh, um, who is more powerful? Um, it is believed that the early changes are more powerful because they interfere with a process that lays down differentiation. However, uh, I'm not sure that that's completely true. Uh, first, we have other times in life where things change. Puberty is one example. And we know that throughout the process of aging, uh, epigenetic changes happen. And so therefore, these might be critical times as well. Uh, but the answer to your question, I think it's still quite clear that the epigenetic uh, programs that are laid down early in life are very important, uh, are probably controlled very, uh, uh, very carefully, and, and the change in them will have a much more major consequence than uh, later changes in life. Very good, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Daphne Maurer, Maurer. How do critical periods fit into the story? You implied that epigenetic changes could be induced at any age, but the existence of a critical period suggests that there are changes in plasticity. Right, so this, this ties into the previous question, right. that there are certain times indeed in development that, that numerous changes in methylation happen in a very, very organized and timed way because they lay down cell type identity. And of course, these are very critical times. The big question is, can we even change those? So theoretically, the answer is yes. But practically, the number of changes that occur during critical period is so numerous that to completely reverse it in a, in a very organized way is a very difficult task. But this is exactly really what people are trying to do when you clone a cell. What you're doing is you're taking a cell that has already gone through the whole program of differentiation and you try to reverse the entire thing. And it seems to be possible. So it, it's not out of question that even, you know, strong multi-layer, multi-stage processes that occur in, in critical periods uh, could be altered if, if one knows how to do it. Very good. Now Question from Sharon Krager as for treatment, can uh, Romanian orphans, now adults, who have an uh, inability to bond and socialize and trust be treated? All right. So the Romanian orphans is, is a really, uh, and one of the most important studies that were done to suggest how early life events are important and probably possibly how epigenetic processes early in life are critical. And one of the things that came out of the study was that there are critical times. That is, uh, if you uh, take the orphans at very young age and adopt them and, uh, you know, essentially foster them in a family that, uh, that is um, of high quality family, high quality parenting, uh, these children will do very well. But if you do it at a later age, which was around, I, I think, two and a half to three years, uh, then it's very hard to, uh, uh, to reverse the early changes. And the answer to your question is, um, obviously, the development is a programmed event. It's like a movie that has you know, uh, the first scene and the second scene and the third scene. And it's very difficult to try to reverse them. You'll get a different movie. And the same way with differentiation. So, and, and so when the brain is formed, now to start to fix things um, that are multi-layered and complicated is very difficult. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it is very difficult. And at this stage, we don't know how to do that. But simpler behaviors could be changed. For example, in my talk, I talked about the, um, the rats and the stress response of the rats. And there, by an epigenetic shock, which is a general epigenetic drug, uh, we could reverse the effects of um, early maternal care. So that suggests that it's not impossible to do, but it is going to be much more complex uh, to achieve. Thank you. Uh, John David Stewart, relations of telomerase and metabolism and uh, 
methylation in aging. Right. So the, uh, the length of telomeres, uh, of course, changes as we age uh, until it reaches such a low level that, that the cells senesce and they cannot divide anymore. They also change in cancer, but in the opposite way. So cancer is really cells becoming young. So uh, the youth of cell is not necessarily a good thing. Um, in the case of cancer, it's a bad thing. That process is considered epigenetic as well. Um, and it is probably controlled by some sort of an internal epigenetic clock that, um, that has its own pace, which is different in, a, uh, in uh, different mammals. Like uh, a mouse lives two years, a human lives 80 years, uh, some other animals can live much longer. And so that clock, the epigenetic clock that defines telomere length uh, is, is, is probably genetically and evolutionary defined. We also know that there is a DNA methylation change as we age. And the correlation between DNA methylation age and telomere age is not perfect. So these are two different processes, but probably related at some, at, at some, at some, at some point, uh, but not perfectly related, which may suggest that there are additional factors. And, and that's why the correlation between methylation age and telomere age is not perfect. It is believed today that DNA methylation age reflects better um, the aging processes than, than telomere age. It's a more accurate predictor uh, of lifespan. Uh, but again, suggesting that there's more going on and that's why these correlations are not perfect, but both are driven, both are considered to be epigenetic processes. Right, thank you. Um, anonymous attendee, as more fathers take on the child rearing as the primary child caregivers in society, would we see the same DNA methylation changes as you have seen with mothers in quotes? It's a very, very interesting question. And, um, and this is a very good example where human brain is driving changes in human evolution. Uh, because uh, as mammals, we usually are dependent on the mammary gland of the mothers. But human evolution has done two things, human brain. First, a lot of ma ma mothers don't use their mammary glands anymore the way they used to uh, historically in evolution. And the second thing is fathers become more and more important as, as, as part of the family and taking more and more roles in, in, in parenting, even at early stages. And we don't know the impact that it had at the epigenetic level. Of course, there is a lot of psycho psych psychological and psychiatry studies on, on the role of the father. But in, at the epigenetic level, we don't know very much. And the main problem is because most of our epigenetic information comes from animals. And uh, there are very few models uh, where, where the, um, the male is important. There are, there are some where the male is important but like voles, certain voles, but, uh, mm -hmm. but usually the models that we use like rats or mice uh, or even monkeys, um, the parents are not important. So this is an open question. Two questions here. Are parents, are fathers important at all except their sperm donation, which has a lot of epigenetic information in it? And second, what happens when our brain is changing evolution? is this going to be followed by an epigenetic adjustment? So now we're introducing a new factor into mammalian evolution, which is the father. And that is a consequence of the evolution of our brain that came up with the idea that fathers might be involved. Uh, will it change? And, and, and this is a question that I keep asking about other social changes uh, in, in our behaviors uh, that are, are triggered not by you know, a classic evolutionary process, but by the brain of humans, by politics, by, 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 by social science, by other things, uh, are they going to have epigenetic adaptation that will be part of evolution? So it's not different than evolution, but it's a new force that is driving now epigenetic changes to adjust to uh, the ideas we came up with about, uh, you know, family and, 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 and how we, we run our lives. Well, this is part of what is now called extended evolutionary theory, which had to incorporate all these things and uh, modern synthesis did not. Well, okay, so next question is from Rebecca or Barton. 
Uh, are there any current trials of information sharing applications such as you described? I don't know. Uh, the, the app world is, is mostly driven by companies uh, who are hoping that this is the new uh, oil rush or gold rush. Uh, the idea is today that data is the most expensive commodity. And indeed, if you look at valuation of companies, uh, companies that have access to more data are valued at much higher. So everybody is trying to mine data. And, um, and because technology develops much better outside universities than in universities, uh, I don't know about many clinical, I mean, clinical trials, of course, use app technology today, but uh, of this range of collecting information in a, in a stochastic uh, way throughout the population, not in a well-designed case control uh, format. And in my opinion, the companies that are doing this are Amazon, uh, Google, and Apple. And they're already collecting a lot of medically relevant data uh, through the uh, toys that they sell us. Uh, we have apps that have health information. We have watches. All these are for a purpose. For example, the big value of a company uh, like Uber is not just uh, in, the, in the taxi service they're providing, but the data they're collecting. Uber knows exactly where we go, when we go, um, uh, and, uh, and who goes, where they live. And so that is enormous information that will have also medical and health uh, uh, implications. So this is the gold rush of today. And I must admit that I think most of it is not done in academic circles, but in, in the field of commercial, uh, trying to make money out of the uh, data. Right. Um, uh, Christine, overall, do you believe the ongoing pandemic will have serious epigenetic effects in the future? Most probably, yes. And at multiple levels. Uh, we have people who were affected by the virus, and, I'm, and there's no question, and there's already early studies suggesting that infection by the virus and the seriousness of infection will have downstream consequences um, that might affect uh, essentially every system in our body, including the brain. There's changes in cytokines, there's changes in different molecules. Each of these molecules can cause epigenetic changes and we still don't have an idea how the body reacts to such a, an assault. Uh, but there's the, there's the more important, I think, epigenetic consequence, which is not caused by the infection, but all the bystanders, the huge bystander effect, which is all of us who uh, were not infected, but our life was turned upside down um, by, by uh, the stress involved with with the government regulations and, and other things that had to do uh, you know, with curfews. And, and, and one, of, one of the most important things is the insecurity or the uh, not knowing what will happen uh, tomorrow. It's, it's unpredictable stress. And unpredictable stress is the most damaging form of stress, right? And um, for example, a, a mouse will, will learn how to deal with a predictable stress, but unpredictable stress to a mouse will cause uh, a depression. And that's one of the ways why, how you induce depression in an animal is by, by subjecting it to unpredictable stress, which is what we all went through. Of course, there's the issue of mothers who are pregnant, about children who, who are in uh, early, early childhood during this period and lost a year of early childhood, which is almost all their early childhood. And so it's hard to believe that all these things will not cause epigenetic consequences. Uh, you know, the studies from the ice storm and 9-11 and, uh, have shown that these things have consequences. And, and this is probably a whole different uh, order of magnitude. It, it doesn't have to be negative consequences. Uh, resilience is also built through uh, experiences like this. So it probably will be a balance and it will be uh, a very exciting field of study uh, to follow up the uh, epigenetic consequences of uh, the different forms that we endured uh, during the, uh, this pandemic, which hasn't ended yet. Right. Um, uh, Ken Percival, maybe I missed it out, but does physical environment conditions, pollution, et cetera, affect genes in the same way? 
Of course. Of course, the physical environment is extremely important. But we got excited about behavioral environment because that was not so straightforward. And uh, that, that was the amazing thing that something that doesn't look chemical uh, has a chemical consequence. And, but it shouldn't be surprising if you understand how the brain works and, and the idea that every behavioral exposure has chemical consequences. And so uh, because we secrete neurotransmitters and chemicals in response to any behavioral encounter. But physical encounters are not different than behavioral encounters. They all alter chemistry in our body. All right, um, thank you. The Hugh uh, Borregard, reduction in nutrition in animals increases life duration. Does it, in fact, DNA, does it affect uh, DNA methylation or does it act via DNA methylation? It's believed that uh, uh, nutrition deprivation um, extends life through a mechanism that involves not necessarily DNA methylation, but more um, acet histone or other protein acetylation, which is another epigenetic process. It has to do with the insulin pathway and with response to food and the way our body reacts, our cells react to excess food uh, that triggers certain um, uh, certain uh, histone deacetylases, which are molecules that are involved in uh, constituents, molecules that are involved in, in marking of proteins rather than marking of DNA. Uh, I am not aware of DNA methylation consequences of um, nutritional deprivation because it works in animals where there's no methylation like nematodes. However, uh, certain diets that involve nutritional restriction do affect the DNA methylation clock in mice. Uh, do they affect uh, the DNA methylation clocks in humans? Uh, we don't know. And we actually, I'm, I'm not fully convinced that uh, starving is the good way to extend your life. Thank you. Um, Daniel Perus, is it possible to obtain PDFs of the presentation and perhaps a copy of the mini video? So I hope that that will happen, right? So Right, that will be distributed to uh, participants. Uh, Kent Weaver, do you have examples of shared technologies currently being used and under whose auspices? So we, this touches to the previous question. Right. Uh, as I said, I'm trying to build some shared technology and I think the, the ones who use shared technology today is the travel as the ways, right? Uh, where that helps you um, navigate the roads and, and, and you push a button and you say, uh, you know, police car or a, an accident and, and the participation of the population uh, makes that software really work well. And so this was the idea behind what I wanted to do. Um, to date, I don't think there is anything I know of that works like this in the health domain. Uh, I think the health apps that people are using are sending data one way. And, uh, but it's very rare to get back, um, you know, information as, ba um, as a consequence of analysis of the data. But this is what we are thinking to do. And uh, it's not yet done, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, thank you for your excellent talk. Can you speculate on new structures we might look forward to in early childhood education. <clears throat> On what? I missed the... Uh... All right. Uh, <clears throat> can you speculate on new structures yes. we might look forward to in early childhood education? New structure, early childhood education. Right. So obviously, I think what you got out of my talk is that early childhood is very critical in establishing epigenetic profiles that uh, you know, are involved most probably in uh, many, many functions, not just behavior or the mental functions, but also phys physiological, physical function. And this is, a, this is a big stretch, you know, like we know so little and you're asking such a big question. And, um, and probably the first 
attempt in answering this question will come not from epigenetic studies, but from social studies, figuring out which forms of education or which forms of intervention works better in early childhood. But there's no question already that, you know, intensive, high quality early childhood uh, environment has positive consequences, which implies that those children who are not exposed to such an environment, uh, interventions that will, will uh, provide access to such uh, an environment will make a big change. And, and, and of course, this has to do with, with populations that are that they're in poverty or in uh, low socioeconomic um, um, environments. They usually, their children are not exposed to this kind of uh, high quality, high uh, intense, intensive and, and enriched environment. And, and this is one of the implications of what we study is governments and other organizations should be encouraged to uh, uh, to provide access to this kind of education early in life so this is this is the first implication i think the second implication and i don't remember if we talked about it or not is that there's no one education that fits all uh, the high animals and the low animals uh, are adapting to a certain situation and therefore each of these groups uh, and the distribution of experiences requires a distribution of education, education that works on uh, the, uh, on on kids with certain background will not work on the other. For example, if you remember my talk, the high animals are less stressed than the low animals. So if you expose the high animals to to learn under stress, they will learn very poorly. If you expose the low animals to learn under stress, for example, on their glucocorticoids, which is a hormone of stress, they will learn better. So, uh, you know, uh, middle class education is some sort of a compromise that uh, probably fits nobody. Uh, it's kind of an average that kind of fits everybody, but nobody, whereas a more targeted education that will fit the environment that the child comes from, of course, will have better consequences. And this is one of the things uh, we're learning. There is um, an enormous distribution uh, of, of phenotypes beyond genetics, right? This is well beyond it. And, and, um, and therefore, um, education has to somehow um, adapt to that kind of enormous distribution and rather than providing one type of education, uh, which usually, you know, deprives both groups uh, from uh, what they need. This is why it is said that uh, children succeed in spite of education. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, here's a question from an anonymous attendee. Can you reverse the impact of trauma? Can what? The reverse trauma? Uh, yes. Impact yes. of trauma. Exactly. That's a very good question. And um, so there are two mechanisms to reverse trauma. One is the mechanism that most of us have in our, in our systems. Uh, most people are resilient to trauma. And uh, it's very interesting that, you know, if you send a group of soldiers to war and they're seeing horrible things there, uh, around 17% will develop PTSD. Most of the soldiers will come back and will have really no problems. And the same is true for those who were exposed to 9-11 or even the Holocaust and, and other traumas that humans are exposed to. So obviously we have inborn mechanisms of resilience, which are most probably epigenetics, epigenetic. The problem is, can we learn from these mechanisms to help those who are in the 17% that will develop serious, even morbid consequences to a traumatic experience? So we have studied this in, in animal models um, and to see if you can traumatize, for example, a rat a rat is traumatized by a cat, and um, and th this rat, when it will be again exposed to anything that reminds of, of the cat, uh, will develop the, the classic symptoms of PTSD. And uh, so we asked the question, um, does it involve epigenetic changes in the brain? And uh, what is the difference between rats that are resilient and rats that are susceptible? By the way, amazingly, rats are like humans, not all rats will develop PTSD. 
And, and so only 17 to 20% of the rats will develop PTSD. And so we asked the question, what happens to the other rats? Are they like normal? And what we found is that the rats that don't develop PTSD develop major epigenetic changes in the brain that kind of outdo the effects of trauma. Normally, naturally, they do that. But 17% don't develop exactly these changes, develop other changes that cause them the behavioral defects that come later. And uh, of course, I shouldn't say cause, but you know, are associated with this. We haven't yet proven which of these changes cause. But we have taken few of the genes that change and injected them back to the rat to see if we get the same phenotypes, and we do. And so the next question we asked is, can we reverse it by using some epigenetic uh, shocks, uh, giving, for example, a metal donor or giving a, a certain vitamins like retinoic acids, which are, uh, can, can change a lot of things, but can they shock the animal to kind of reverse those epigenetic consequences and make them more resilient? And the answer was yes. Now the big question is, can we translate this to humans? And, and this is where uh, you know, we are still struggling, is how to uh, take these results from the animals and test it on people. I mean, the good news is that what we used in the animals are actually acceptable, approved vitamins and nutritional supplements. And so that should make it easier. But nevertheless, uh, doing, you know, translating to humans is always not as easy as doing it in rats. But I think I see no reason why it shouldn't be possible theoretically the question is how to do it properly. And that's where, you know, clinical trial and, and, and ex experimentation and trial and error comes to place. But effects of trauma should be possibly reversible. Uh, here's a question from Judy Kenigsberg. How do autoimmune diseases come into play? How do they lead to? Uh, how do autoimmune diseases come into play? Of course, autoimmune diseases involve epigenetic dysregulation that dysregulates the, um, you know, the distribution of immune cells, uh, whether regulatory cells or others, and the, the body starts, um, the body doesn't normally control uh, its reaction against itself the way the process has to uh, develop normally. There's also evidence that certain autoimmune diseases can be um, inspired by environmental changes, and, and that most possibly goes through epigenetic changes. It's a very active field of research, and people are investigating epigenetic differences uh, between people who suffer or don't from autoimmune disease and, and how environmental insults are triggering those, uh, those diseases. Here is a question that re uh, refers to the 16th, sorry, um, at the 16th annual senior college symposium yesterday, we heard from Richard, Richard Framble mm -hmm. that poor mat uh, maternal nurture could program children for violence and epigenetic changes that underlay these behaviors might be passed to offsprings. So bad boys and bad girls could blame their mothers and grandmothers. But aren't epigenetic changes all undone soon after the oocyte is fertilized? Right. So first, Richard Tremblay is a very uh, long-term, long-time collaborator of mine, and we both studied the epigenetic of aggression uh, using his uh, tremendous experience in, in starting, in, in in actually pioneering the field of understanding how aggression uh, starts developing not at puberty where people go to jail, but when the people are very young uh, um, children. And uh, that early life is defining uh, trajectories of aggression and that uh, they might and possibly involve epigenetic changes. So now you ask the question, how is the transgenerational transmission of aggression working if epigenetic changes are erased? So, Epigen not all epigenetic changes are erased. And actually those that are associated with aggression are probably not fully erased. And the reason is probably evolutionary because aggression was developed as probably as some sort of an adaptation uh, to a very um, harsh environment. 
And it's quite uh, useful to pass this kind of experience uh, to your offspring who are going to be born in exactly the same environment and might face the same kind of aggression. And for example, it's, uh, it's very useful to save you from predators uh, or to get you prey. And, um, and of course, uh, that is dependent on the environment where you live. And if, if historically, uh, offspring lived in the same environment that their uh, parents lived in. And so it makes sense that evolution would not erase um, transgenic marks of, uh, let's say, how do you react with aggression or how you react to food. And there is data that suggests that epigenetic marks that relate to, you know, reacting to plenty or lack of food uh, do pass uh, across generations. Again, makes sense evolutionary that these things will be conserved. So what I think has happening early in life in gametogenesis is that a lot of the information is erased because you want to build a new animal or a new human being uh, with new experiences. However, evolution has preserved perhaps is some of the epigenetic changes because they are passing very useful information for the fitness of the species and the survival of the species is dependent on passing this information. So this is a very active field to see how much of this information is actually left in the sperm and left in the egg and is escaping the early development changes that are raised. Uh, it's true that originally early on we thought like your question that everything is erased, but now we understand that not everything is erased. And there's multiple levels of evidence that not everything is erased. And I speculate that part of it has to go, has to do with evolution and with uh, fitness. But there is another very powerful mechanism of epigenetic transmission of traits that has nothing to do with your germline or the gametes. It has to do with the environment because environments usually are quite stable then environments can pass those epigenetic traits. Exactly what I showed uh, with the rats, right? In the rat case, it's not the gametes, it's the mother. It could be a, a fostering mother, it's the environment. And usually environments are quite stable. So if a child is born to an aggressive parent, the parents can pass to the child the aggressive behavior, not necessarily uh, through their sperm or egg, but through their behavior which fashions the epigenetic programming of the brain during early childhood. And I think this is a much more important mechanism of transmission. And therefore, the only way to break a cycle of environment is to break the environment, to change the environment, to, uh, to change the environment to less aggressive environment, that will kind of break this chain of transmission. Very good. Um... Uh, here is a compliment from Pierre Lalonde. Your conference is so clear for explaining complexity. Can you produce a strip, bande dessinée, for general public about epigenetics? <laughs> He's another uh, project. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. I mean, I've given uh, you know quite a few uh, public lectures, and uh, you probably can find most of them if you're in a public domain. Uh, but I always toyed with the idea of writing a textbook um, on epigenetics, not for, you know, professionals, but for uh, the general public. Uh, I need just time, need to retire to, uh, to be able to do that. But I also waited for the epigenetic field to clear a bit, uh, because, um, you know, it's very exciting, but it's very early. So we have answer to very few questions, and many questions to many questions. And uh, so, um, so it's, it's the question is, when is the right time to start sharing, uh, you know, a highly professional kind of level of knowledge uh, with the lay public without uh, risking uh, the truth, you know, and, and how you balance the need to simplify uh, with the need to be truthful. And I think the more developed the field is, the easier it becomes to, uh, to transmit it to the general public who doesn't know the ins and outs of the of the uh, details of the field. Very good. So we are looking forward to that moment. Uh, Constance Charlton asks, does methylation of sperm DNA change in an adult? Would sperm made after a catastrophic uh, event be different? Yeah. Very good points. You know, all your questions are projects. 
And, um, and one of the interesting questions is what's the effect of trauma on sperm? And um, in animals, it probably has an effect. And, uh, but the nice thing about sperm, you know, that it cycles. And so um, there is uh, different animals have a different time where sperm develops. And usually we get rid of that sperm and new sperm develops. So sperm uh, is, we can intervene with sperm, for example, if one suspects that trauma has an effect on sperm, probably waiting some time after the trauma before procreation uh, could be a good suggestion. Uh, I've seen research uh, looking at cannabis exposure. Cannabis exposure has an impact on sperm. But oh. if, if a person waits a, f a few months to allow the whole cycle of sperm spermatogenesis to, uh, to go through, then the effects might be much lower. You see less epigenetic effects on the sperm. So uh, sperm is quite, is, it's a very interesting question that has implications on uh, you know, reprodu reproduction strategies in humans is, is what is the right time uh, to have children vis-a-vis uh, -vis experiences like trauma, drug exposure and others that might have affected the methylation pattern of sperm. So it's better to have children early in life or wait? To, right, to... so that's another study. Um, the general understanding now is that there are epigenetic drifts in sperm as we age, and a sperm is aging as well. And it seems that that might have to do with certain uh, diseases like uh, autism uh, and others. So uh, it seems that the, the old wisdom of having children when you are young is probably still worthwhile. Okay. Now, here's a question from Peter Watson. When, say, plant breeders are using selective breeding to produce new varieties, can we say what is the relative importance of genetics and epigenetics? Classic breeding, of course, is based on genetics. And uh, this is how we learn genetics from breeding experiments. Uh, but it's possible that we select also for epigenetic phenotypes in breeding. And for example, um, you know, how much of the, epi of the changes that we see when we read dogs uh, are really selection for genetic variants or are they selection for epigenetic variants? It's very interesting. And uh, for example, domestication uh, can alter phenotypes at a rate that this cannot be explained just by genetic uh, selection. And so definitely epigenet epigenetic phenotypes are there. And uh, I am not sure, I don't know, it doesn't mean nobody has looked at it, but I don't know about an attempt to quantify in a breeding experiment, uh, how much of the selection is genetic and how much is epigenetic. The difference is that epigenetic uh, selections may not work by Mendelian rules. That is, you know, we have two chromosomes, two alleles, and, uh, and we have a certain mathematics of how, how, how we inherit these changes. Epigenetics might be dominant. And so even if only one allele had the epigenetic change, the other allele might be affected by it because epigenetics can act in cis and can act in trans, can act on the same chromosome, can act on other chromosome. And so it might break the, uh, you know, the Mendelian rules that by which we kind of calculate inheritance uh, when we do breeding. And so it might have a much larger impact than genetic selection. Uh, we just don't know. I don't think we know. Mm. Okay, here's a question from Charles Maurer. A lifetime ago when I took biology, Lamarckism was the poster child for scholarly nonsense. Right. How is Lamarck seen nowadays? Right. So of course, Lamarck uh, was a bit uh, resuscitated by, uh, by epigenetics. And, um, and uh, for example, you know, there was a paper that wasn't done by us, but was done by another group that sh showed how uh, mice can develop a new smell, um, a, new, uh, a new fear of smell of cherries, which is usually a positive uh, signal for, uh, for a mouse. But if you pair that smell with, uh, with an with a electroshock, it becomes a fearful smell. And the mouse learns to recognize the cherries as, as something scary. 
and uh, it uh, it then passes it to the next generations, up to three or four generations. And so here is learning of something of something that is a very strong evolutionary trait, which is which smells we are afraid of. For example, a rat uh, will smell uh, cat urine from a distance and will freeze, right? And, and that's evolutionary, right? Because those rats that loved cat smell are not with us anymore, right? So the only rats that survived are those that learned to smell a cat. And so this is a very genetic evolutionary selection. But if we can have an epigenetic selection of learning which smells are bad for us and pass it to the next generation, that goes much, goes much faster because you don't need to eat all the rats that don't have that uh, smell. It it's operates at, at a much higher level, much faster rate. So, it, so it, is, it is quite possible that these processes are, are indeed working. And they sound like Lamarckian, which is evolution that is directed by environment rather than selected by environment. Right, Darwinian uh, selection, natural selection, is selection by environment, which is only those that have the trait that allows them to fit survive. Uh, Lamarckism was that uh, you know the funny things they made fun of him was the giraffe that has to uh, you know raise its neck because it has to catch the uh, you know the fruit that is uh, hanging high, and um, maybe there is some truth in it because this mouse learned how to recognize a new smell at a much higher rate without any selection, right? So it is possible. But like anything in life, anything we say has some truth and some lies in it. And uh, as we, so Lamarckism was probably had some truth in it, but not everything. And uh, we learned slowly what was truthful and what was not. Very good. Now, here's a question from Debbie Mercier. Have the results of your research been shared with the Department, uh, Département de la Protection Jeunesse in the hopes of informing public social policies related right. to adoption and foster care in the provinces? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't stop. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, the research of my partners who are more interested in the social and psychological aspects of the study, I'm more interested in the biochemical aspect of the study, uh, has been known to governments and, and, and has had, I hope, some effect on the way uh, governments operate. They are well, well aware of it. There were committees in in the British Parliament that were interested in this kind of research. And some of my collaborators spoke to them. And uh, definitely in Quebec, Richard Tremblay had a, had a large impact on, uh, on early, early, uh, early life education. And, um, but how much of this research uh, is known and how much of it has an impact is a question for all research, uh, how, 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 how much governments uh, use the research that is produced to change policy is it is a question that is beyond research it has to do with politics but in my opinion there is a higher awareness um, to to the importance of early life even in in government circles in this province and other provinces in Canada uh, and a lot of it was promoted by my collaborators um, who uh, who, uh, who went to government and spoke about about the results of these studies Thank you. Uh, here is a question from an anonymous at attendee. Are there studies that have begun on young babies who are being affected by the COVID situation? By the COVID? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but I would have done. This is a study I'm very interested in. And I have no doubt that some people are looking at it. I don't know if, if uh, those who worked on the ice storm are looking at it, but uh, I would be surprised if they don't. All right, so here's a question from Tom, Tom Nesmith. It seems to me that epigenetics has immense implications for social behavior and policy. Have you had any discussions about that with those in fields with th those interests? Yes, slowly, you know, the social, studies environment is getting interested in epigenetics 
there is a big battle in, uh, in those who do social studies uh, between the biologists, those who believe that social you know, processes are biologically triggered, and those who think they're completely different thing. And uh, there are even psychiatrists who think that, uh, you know, neurology and psychiatry have nothing in common. There is the machine of the brain and there's the soul. And uh, also a lot of social scientists think this way, that behavioral process is a world by its own. It's, it's not dependent on, on, um, on the biological processes. It, what epigenetics does, it actually merges biological processes with social processes and shows how these things could be connected, not in the magical form, but in a reasonable, plausible form. And therefore, economists, social policy uh, uh, you know, researchers, uh, political scientists, and others, and historians uh, are getting interested in epigenetics. But there are major roadblocks, one of which is the way we educate our children. Children are either going to study what they call science or humanities. And I think you understood very well that there is no real difference between humanities and science. Uh, it's just different sides of looking at the same question. Uh, how can you understand wars without understanding the brains that drive the war? And how can you understand wars without understanding the consequences that wars have on the brain and on the body? These are all biological processes. The politician who takes a decision to have, uh, to have uh, an aggression against another people or a group of his own people uh, is secreting many neurotransmitters when he takes that decision. It's a, it's a highly chemical process. And so to think that you can understand history without understanding neurochemistry is probably nonsense. And also to think that you can understand neurochemistry without understanding epigenetics behind this, or the, uh, without understanding the epigenetic consequences of neurochemistry is also nonsense. But because we train both doctors and researchers in sub, 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 sub disciplines, and we can't even communicate with them, right? Because a lot of the people in, in these fields, when I talk to them, we don't understand what I'm saying nor do I understand what they're saying because they have their terminology for processes that had it been expressed in some more lay language, I would understand, but the same words in English mean completely different things in different disciplines. Even within medicine, even within cancer, uh, diff people who treat different cancers will use similar terms in different ways. And so the linguistic barrier, we are speaking many, many different languages. And we are training from early childhood in these many different languages. So somebody who goes through a liberal art kind of history of education will have very little exposure to the language of biology. But this has to change. And I think uh, what I believe in very strongly is that, yes, everybody can be an expert only, anybody can be an expert on one thing, but we should be able to talk to other people. This is the importance of language. Language allows communication within, between different individuals. And so we can need to create a common language of, of humanity whereby an epigenetic cyst can talk to a historian uh, or be interested in history and to talk to politicians. And I have done a, some of this because I was privileged to get both forms of education. And, and I believe that uh, you know one of the defects of science education is very little exposure to, uh, to liberal arts ways of thinking and vice versa. And one of my dreams was to create an epigenetic textbook uh, for history students or for economic students or for uh, uh, philosophy students, because it's impossible that you, know, you will study philosophy without understanding evolution or without understanding uh, you know, epigenetics. I, so I think, I think uh, we're coming back to some sort of a renaissance in education, where we moved from Renaissance, where everybody had to know everything, to everybody has to know nothing except one thing, and now back to, yes, we cannot know everything. Even epigenetics is too complicated. Even I don't understand any more all aspects of epigenetics, but it gets more complicated as we speak. But nevertheless, we need to create a common language, which will be bequeathed to our children at very early life, so they can talk to each other 
and, and, and tackle problems uh, together. Well, this is an excellent uh, and very appropriate uh, last answer from this series of questions. And I didn't mention, but many people have along the questions expressed their uh, big uh, thank you and uh, appreciation of your uh, clarity of presentation and clarity of, uh, of course, this answer. So uh, Dr. Moshe Schiff, thank you very much for your illuminating presentation and outstanding ability to convey complex things to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a privilege to talk to you and I enjoyed so much the questions. And usually I get much better questions when I talk to a general audience than when I talk to a uh, specialty audience. And your questions were all to the point. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you again.